Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're um, having a short interview today as a kind of uh, follow-up in response to the presentation on George William Russell. And I wanted to start by um, sharing with you all uh, an email that was written to me by a friend of mine who was familiar with the life and the writings of Russell and who viewed the, uh, the video on the IWC channel um, probably a week or 10 days after the event. And uh, what she wrote to me was that when she started the video, uh, that it was simultaneous with this full arc of a rainbow that appeared <laughs> Uh, outside her door from where she was sitting inside her home and uh, that she said reached from horizon to horizon and that it persisted in its full intensity for at least 15 minutes and then as the video of the presentation moved more deeply into its subject faded into that vast oneness of the silvery gray sky that envelops the world after a brilliant display of the primordial spectrum. So I'm reading from her words because they're so beautifully expressed. And then she goes on to say that um, in learning of the enormous efforts and successes made by AE to uplift and inspire a downtrodden people and to infuse the teaching of humanity's divine origins with new life, it is heartbreaking to imagine the pain he must have endured while witnessing the destructive effects of wars industrialization, and civil strife, which unraveled so much of his work. I was deeply struck with the realization that this is how it is and how it always has been. The great seers are born and grow in our midst and illuminate everything around them for a while. And then the waves of ignorance flow into the crooks and crannies of hope and obscure their light. And finally, we have pontiffs and cynics who come along and assure us that they never existed or that they were charlatans or simply lunatics. But A.E. in his nonviolent and courageously loving way fought the good fight and never wavered. I remember reading how the father of W.B. Yeats tried to warn his son away from the close friendship he had forged with A.E. As a 19th century rationalist, John Yeats did not see the mystical path his son was taking as an advantage in the literary world. But A.E.'s path was of a sort that pulled him out of the salons and into the byways of poverty, spiritual longing, and cosmic mysteries. He seemed to encompass the sevenfold nature of the human condition in his existence, all aspects of his being illuminated by a divine vision as he sought that lonely but noble fight. He exemplified the undeterred will to bring the light of pure spirit into the world, even if it were only as a brief pulse beat of a hidden divine heart. So uh, with that, um, we're also going to take up uh, a few questions that uh, Colette has agreed to share with us. How is the kind of imagination that A.E. spoke of distinguished from lesser forms of fantasy or fancy? Can mystic experiences also lead to false conclusions? Yes, uh, this is really a central question and one that we thought would uh, uh, come up as a result of the presentation. Um, and um, A.E. as well as other mystics, as well as uh, philosophers and thinkers who have studied mystical experience um, do distinguish between various levels of uh, mystic um, intuitions, um, as well as what are called uh, lower forms of, of psychism uh, or of, of, of fantasy and, and of imagination. And uh, we did us take this up to some degree in the talk that we gave the, um, the year prior on the boundless mind. Uh, and where we mentioned uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who lived 100 years before AE, uh, and who wrote 
be, began a kind of study of uh, trying to understand the, the role of imagination in great writers and thinkers, uh, of which he was one himself, both a writer and theologian. And, um, and similar to the way we discussed it in the talk, he said that at its pinnacle, it is deemed uh, a participation in the creative action of eternity itself. And there's this famous quote that uh, comes from his writings. He said that the primary imagination I hold to be a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. And uh, Coleridge uh, compared this kind of very exalted uh, idea of imagination with what he called uh, lower forms of fancy or fantasy, which he said were a, um, experiences or mental productions in which there was a kind of uh, rearrangement, a collation, or sort of scrambling and then reassembly of uh, lower forms of, of, of uh, ment mental um, um, productions, um, which give the appearance of something unique being created, but in fact are, um, there's no real creativity taking place. And this is kind of akin to what uh, I think y you might find in like modern forms of AI, where you get these uh, um, remarkable images being produced, but it's, it's being drawn from a vast data bank in which you know, various already constituted elements are brought together in a new way um, so it's not really creative in the, in, the, in the same sense that it would be necessarily in, in the higher functionings of the mind. And, and um, H.P. Blavatsky, who, as we pointed out, was a, was a pivotal uh, writer and figure in A.E.'s life, spoke of uh, the distinction between these higher and lower forms of experience and of imagination and of human thought uh, and perception as uh, on the one hand being the lower forms being psychic, the higher she termed noetic, which were a true kind of uh, descent in, into human consciousness of what we would consider to be the divine. And um, that the lower forms were uh, muddied and colored by lower forms of identity, by um, personal, uh, a sort of constricted sense of, of uh, a personal self associated with name and form, and also uh, desires and passions that, are, that go along with that. And A.E. did write um, a number of uh, short stories. The Cave of Lilith is one. Um, uh, the Temptress of the Woods is another one. Priestess of the Woods, rather. Uh, and Tragedy in the Temple was the third one, and these were all published uh, in multiple uh, journals. But um, the, they are cases in which he, he uses a, in the guise of a, a, a sort of a fictional uh, a portrayal, a series of events, this kind of the, the temptations and the trials and the difficulties and dangers that arise in, in the mystic path uh, where one is tempted into byways that are not necessarily serving the larger good or the good of, of the aspirant. And, um, and so there's, uh, we would, um, in, in particular, the, uh, the image of Lilith is a very memorable one, which, um, which you also find in many traditions, right? It's not as though A.E. was portraying something that uh, is out of continuity with uh, what you find, in, for example, in the Hindu tradition, where Mara is, is sort of a personification of, uh, of the temp temptations that, uh, that an aspirant encounters. And in fact, it was Maha Mara, the great Mara, which um, is said to have tempted the Buddha on the very night of his enlightenment to draw him away from uh, the, the path of meditation which he had chosen in the service of humanity. And, and then also one could mention that uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which was one of the um, great uh, text, Hindu texts that A.E. throughout his life uh, felt was uh, central to the path he had chosen. The, the, the whole takes place within the context of the Mahabharatan war, 
which one way of understanding that is the war between uh, these higher forms of noetic consciousness, of divine awareness, the divine spark within every human being, uh, whether characterized as Krishna or Christos, between that, uh, which he would say, yes, that's our true self, our true nature, and um, the, our lesser forms of self that uh, you know, are seeking some worldly aim or uh, that we've long engendered on the basis of, a, uh, the, the, uh, again, a false sense of, of, of who I am, of a false personality. And uh, <clears throat> just as a final point, that in the Ayer's um, introduction, uh, which I meant to bring today, I didn't bring it, but uh, The Descent of the Gods, which is just, again, one of the uh, the best books that one could undertake. It's really a lifetime study, as we mentioned, but um, they, they point out that A.E.'s path uh, could be characterized as one uh, similar to that which Plotinus outlined. Plotinus was a third century philosopher and mystic who um, said that, that the pursuit of truth really has to take place on three levels, uh, that of reason, that of intuition, and that of experience. And um, <clears throat> in, uh, that of reason, of course, would have to do with philosophical inquiry, with um, the uh, higher forms of, of noetic logic um, that, that is a, a kind of dialectic between uh, inexpressible uh, universal or spiritual truths and their um, expression uh, through concepts or through practice and embodiment. Um, that would be uh, a, a form of the pursuit of truth. And the second being intuition, which we, we would, you know, ultimately is that, <clears throat> that form of direct cognition or experience that one has in consciousness as a result of the practice of meditation on, on the spiritual path. And the third being experience, being that um, not only uh, sort of the karmic uh, outcomes and um, um, both su whether subjective or objective in one's own life and the life of, of those around one, but also the experience of other mystics and great philosophers and spiritual teachers. And, and this is why uh, Blavatsky was so critical uh, of, of a discovery uh, and friendship that, um, that A.E. developed because she pointed to the idea that um, the perennial teaching, that there's this universal uh, philosophical uh, framework which has been verified over ages by many mystics and seers and great sages uh, independently in every department of nature. So it became a kind of, uh, you could say, touchstone by which A.E. was able to sort of gauge and test and understand, make sense of uh, his own visionary experiences. So that's a long answer, but the, it's, a, it's a very, <laughs> it's a deep topic. So thank you for raising that question. Can you describe A.E.'s participation in theater? since the establishment of the Irish National Theatre was such an important part of the Irish Renaissance? Well, this is a, another big topic, um, which would just touch on a, a few points. Um, and Summerfield uh, covers it very extensively in his uh, biography, um, because it is true that this whole uh, rediscovery of bardic literature and the translation of uh, these ancient uh, Celtic myths into English was at the very root uh, of the, um, the Irish literary and uh, theatrical uh, renaissance and birth. Um, and that, so that writers and dramatists drew from these myths to, um, <clears throat> to create a, a, a theater and, and a literature that really was, became you know, world renowned <clears throat> and that um, A.E., of course, was at the very heart of that because of all the writing he did in showing that it was also part of it, this universal tradition and that he, um, he in fact, wrote the, the very first play that was enacted by the, uh, the Irish Literary Theater before it became the National Theater uh, 
it was um, and was based on an, uh, a Celtic myth, uh, and uh, it was a three. It was a short play of three acts, which he himself per performed uh, one of the characters in, in fact, a very spellbinding performance. <laughs> it said, uh, and uh, but he also went on to assist in the uh, the design of costumes in uh, uh, stage scenery. He gave uh, financial support to. Um, the theater as it became established as an organization, um, and 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 so on. In fact, he was vice president uh, of the um, the theater society for a number of years. But then, at a certain point, withdrew. And this is the other big part of the story that is not often spoken of. But he um, he had a very different vision for the theater than did Yeats and others who were involved. And uh, this became uh, sort of a, the, one of the big points of contention between Yeats and Russell that lasted for many years. And Yeats' Yeats's perspective, if I could you know, sort of briefly characterize it, had to do with he wanted to establish it on the English model, sort of aristocratic model, and also very uh, auto autocratically controlled by kind of a central committee, uh, which would limit, which would decide upon which plays could be played and and um, and he was hoping for sort of a modern interpretation of, of um, Celtic myth where characters were more humanized and and brought in so uh, incorporating elements of uh, modern theater whereas uh, Russell wanted something that was that immortalized uh, the Celtic myth more in the in the tradition of uh, the Greek tragedies and he, he also wanted it to be a democratic institution that it would allow for new uh, aspiring playwrights to have a chance to, to do productions. And finally, um, uh, he also wanted it to be made available to the poor. He was not interested in it being only something, uh, you know, an event for high society, but he wanted it to be um, um, smaller and more intimate and uh, inexpensive to attend, uh, and free performances being performed, etc. cetera. But um, the, uh, so at a certain point, it was in uh, 1905, after the National Theater had been established, and all the effort and work that he had helped put into its establishment, and uh, his friendships with Lady Gregory, for example, who was also a, a playwright drawing from Celtic myths, who we, who we mentioned, um, he withdrew and took almost all the actors with him <laughs> uh, because they, he, had, he had such a de deep influence uh, uh, on the performers. He had become friends with him, with them, uh, for one, and they were sympathetic to his viewpoint and perspective. And um, in fact, it was uh, one of the leading ladies who wrote that at that point in 1905, is in her view when the National Theater died. <laughs> but it went on, uh, in fact, to produce mem many memorable uh, plays and become you know, world-renowned in, um, in its productions and fame. So anyway, that, there's a, a few tidbits about it. Can more be said about A.E.'s life as a painter? Was it a past time for him? Or one of his many professions. Yeah, this uh, again we <clears throat> we only briefly touched on it uh, in the presentation, really. Um, but there was, uh, as we mentioned, it was one of his first loves as uh, as a child, even, and um, and there, but there came a point uh, in uh, when he when he uh, ended his formal education and, and entered art school. Uh, where he was also had become very involved in uh, the the, um, the theosophical efforts, organizational efforts being made in Dublin, um, where and this was also occurred after he met both H. P. Blavatsky and Judge, and had been gun, uh, begun studying in a very serious way the um, the great literature of the East uh, and of and of mystic philosophy, and that's when he for a time. Put his all his efforts in painting on on hold for a five or six year period, and this is around uh, 1888 or nine. 
But um, when he took them up again, so he, so he abandoned painting as a profession, which would have been his first choice, but he never gave it up as a pastime. And um, in fact, you know, uh, many of his friends remarked about how he, <laughs> he would shift from, you know, after long uh, hours of, of uh, discussion in, in a kind of a salon fashion, either in his home or that of others, uh, he would immediately go to his easel and begin working on his paintings. And, um, and also when he vacationed, he would uh, uh, assemble a whole series of uh, colored images with pastel or colored chalk. And then over the course of the, the months that followed, he would produce uh, you know, full-fledged paintings from those color images. And he, um, he was very... He was quite productive, given given his prolific out, output and involvement uh, with other um, uh, fields of interest, including theater, writing, poetry, etc., uh, and study. He he uh, he he painted a remarkable amount, but he also he didn't take the same kind of care to make sure that his that the that the uh, paint mixtures and and uh, the constitution of the of the uh, materials he was using would have a longevity to them. So many of them, for example, have faded or, or have simply you know, fallen apart. And he, when he had shows, he participated in many group shows with other artists. He would place his paintings at a very low cost as, at, at the dismay of uh, many of the other artists because they felt they, <laughs> that it was unfair that, that he was asking such a low amount but, uh, for his paintings. But uh, apparently this was because he wanted to make them available to uh, those who uh, were, had of lesser means, let's say. But uh, uh, just a final point is that where he did vacation and where he produced many of his remarkable sketches, with, which often included these uh, uh, sort of visionary um, images that um, these were uh, these, his favorite vacation spots were along the western coast of uh, Ireland, uh, I believe it's Donegal County, where he, he wrote that he had, in fact, uh, it was at uh, Ross's Point, he said, where he, he saw the Celtic gods. And uh, not only that, but that others who also had this kind of mystic capacity of which he wrote, who were his friends and co-aspirants, that they, there was more than one occasion where there was kind of a simultaneous experience of these, um, what we would call visionary um, perceptions into the deeper, you know, so normally hidden aspects of nature. So, so again, that was kind of confirmation that what he was seeing was not just some projection of his own mind, but it, but it had an independent objective reality to it. But um, he, um, um, he would, these were also his, his favorite uh, vacation spots, and you can understand why, where um, he would then uh, um, produce these sketches that, that later became paintings. So again, that's uh, just a few tidbits on that, on that question.